How many pairs of jeans do you own? Probably a few, but how many pairs of jeans do you actually lease? So don't own, but lease it. Uh, not that much, but maybe that's going to change in the future. Why? Well, this is exactly the idea of the founders of Mud Jeans 10 years ago. Why can't you lease a pair of jeans? And if you don't like it anymore, just send it back so it can be recycled. It is the story about Mud Jeans. And on the 9th of December 2021, my next guest will give a riveting and stunning story about uh, uh, about their company at the Regio Zwolle Congress. But uh, she decided to join me before we start that Congress. And uh, with me today is Laura Vicaria, CSR Manager at Mud Jeans. Laura, good to see you. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Uh, well, the, the, the Mud Jane story is an incredible story, but I don't know if everybody knows it. So could you elaborate a little bit on what you're all about? Yes, happy to. Well, Mud Jeans is a circular denim brand. We are pioneers in the denim industry. Basically what we do, we make our new jeans out of old jeans. There's a couple of unique elements in the business that helps this happen. Starting with design, we apply circular design techniques, but also our business model. We have a business model that is called lease a jeans model. So we lease our jeans to our customers for a period of 12 months and encourage them to send back the product once they're done using it. In this way, we give our customers the opportunity to own a new product without the environmental anxiety of having that new product. Then uh, we, that um, structure also gives us as a brand the opportunity to take responsibility over our own waste. The jeans that come back to us either go into our vintage collection if they're still in good condition, and the ones that are not, we recycle them and plug them back into production. And that's basically how we close the loop. Wow. Yeah. So, so how many pairs of jeans do you get back? What, what, what percentage? Um, well, an estimated within the first year, I can tell you, we have an estimated 80% of jeans that come back to us. Wow. That's quite something. And, and, and what is the incentive of people really sending it back? Because it, 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 you, you, um, brand it as leasing, but mm -hmm. at the end of the 12 months, I can also keep it. I can just keep it in my closet and don't pay anymore. So, so what's the, their incentive to really send it back to you guys? Well, we don't really care if it's after 12 months or three years or however long for us, what's interesting is that you send it back. Um, but what's the incentive there? Um, there's two layers and this is very much also, um, reflected on the type of customer we have, we have one is that we relieve you of your waste and that sort of responsibility to it and maybe guilt of having to throw something away because there isn't really such a thing as a way. Uh, and, and the second is, of course, we make a financial incentive, which is that you get either 10 euros of your next purchase, because you mm. can also purchase a pair of jeans or a month off of your next lease. Wow. And, 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 and uh, are people uh, only keeping the jeans for a year or are they wearing it for years and years and then sending it back? What's, what's the average there? There's all kinds of people that um, have different relationships with their jeans. Of course, if you have one pair and you love them and you wear them every day and you cycle with them and, you know, <laughs> they, they can only survive so far. But I guess if you have different varieties, then, of course, the life of that product is, is a little bit different. Yeah. So um, this is all about, of course, the impact of the jeans industry uh, on, on, the, on, on the planet. And um, not that many people know that, but the, the jeans industry has an enormous impact. Could, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, happy to. It's not only the jeans industry. Actually, it's the whole fashion industry. If you paid attention to COP26, that just happened. In fact, the fashion industry was named specifically, which already, already tells you quite a lot. But the fashion industry is accountable for 4% of global emissions. And uh, for example, more specifically, there's just a huge waste problem. Globally, there's an estimated 92 million tons of textile waste, and people are just wearing their clothes far, far less. They'll wear it, buy new items, and wear it you know, maybe only seven times before they start throwing it away. So that's already a huge problem of materials and overconsumption. But jeans specifically, and this is also why we decided to um, only focus on jeans in mud jeans um, to try to revolutionize the fashion industry, is because A, jeans is one of the most um, 
relatable items, whether you like fashion or not, but it's also one of the dirtiest items in your wardrobe in the sense that it consumes high level of chemicals. It has some pretty sketchy dark sides in terms of the social responsibility aspect of it. It has also, it, because it's primarily made out of cotton, it requires a lot of water, an estimated between seven and 10,000 liters of water. So it's, it's just a very bad product that if we show, hey, there's an alternative to make this product, a circular alternative to make this product, product then hopefully we also make a sprinkle of hope that the rest of the fashion industry oh. can also behave in this way. So I read that um, uh, you use up to 40% of uh, recycled post, post-consumer post denim in your new pants. Um, explain to me why this is an accomplishment. Well, post-consumer recycled co- uh, cotton is very much an, an, an accomplishment because of the um, challenges that go with making a product in this way. So to give you a little bit of uh background information. When you when we collect the genes, they are then sent to our supply chain partner in Spain. There they will cut off the buttons and the zippers and all of these little elements that cannot be recycled. The, it is then chopped into small pieces and then shredded into fibers. These fibers are very short. And that is the key of the challenge of using post-consumer recycled cotton. Because when you start blending it with organic cotton to make the new yarn and the new fabric, the more short yarn you put in there, the weaker that fabric could end up. Mm -hmm. So we really wanted to say, okay, we want to use uh, as much as we can of this post-consumer recycled cotton. And we challenged a little bit our suppliers, hey, how can we do this? And they really actually came through and and now we're working with this. But, you know, our big objective is to actually reach 100% post-consumer. How far are you away from that? We are pretty close. Actually, we're working with Saxon University. Um, They are really the um, scientists behind the innovation there. And actually, um, we hope to have the first sample by the end of the year. So, Laura, the thing with uh, circularity, it's all about the design and how do you design a pair of jeans that can be recycled uh, easily. So what, what are the trade-offs or, or the difficulties that you face there? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the difficulty is how to design it so that it can be recycled. It seems obvious, <laughs> but that's the biggest challenge. Um, and the way to do that is really to stick to monomaterials. That's why we only uh, primarily work with cotton and recycled cotton so that when that product is um done, um, we can easily take it back and recycle it and reuse it. If you start uh, really blending different types of materials into that fabric, then making that uh, recycling process is impossible. Well, not impossible, but far, far more difficult and more expensive. So we we really um, design with that monomaterial aspect in mind and simplicity is key. So we really have one type of button, one type of rivet, we don't have, for example, the leather patch at the back of the de- of the jeans. Um, that has been removed and replaced with a printed on version. And all of those design um, decisions are really, um, well, part of, of the objective to be able to, to recycle that product again. And, and what about the zippers and um, uh, these, these little buttons you have here? Is that all from one, uh, one material or is it plastic and metal combined? How does it work? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Um, Those are sort of the small elements, the small um, obstacles you have to uh, overcome as a circular denim brand. So they're very much part of our objectives. When it comes to the buttons and the rivets, um, they are made out of stainless steel. And they currently are removed and recycled, but we are not in charge of that recycling process. Uh, in the sense that they get removed in Spain and then they get sent off to other Spanish facilities where we don't have much control over what happens to the product after that. But we are actually right now in the process of implementing a better solution for that so that, for example, you can remove the button and reuse it somewhere else or that it can actually be blended, um, excuse me, not blended, melted back uh, Mm -hmm. into a a new button or reused again. So that's what we're working towards. The zipper is far more complicated. 
So are you really at the forefront of innovation at, at that point? It, it, this, this has never been done before, or are you really challenging uh, your suppliers in that? It is difficult to find suppliers that want to try uh, to do these type of things. I believe we are not the only ones um, trying to find solutions for this. In fact, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is doing a great job in incentivizing other denim industry, other denim brands to take similar steps. Um, they have uh, the jeans redesign project, and part of that is the buttons. So I am aware that there's um, techniques about unscrewing the button so that you can take it apart easily and do something else with that. But we're not really sure where uh, the brands are within their own journeys, to be honest. So, so how hard is it to be at the forefront? Because you're trying to do the right thing. You face all kinds of design challenges. You're not the biggest company in the world. You don't have R&D budgets uh, going everywhere, I guess. How hard is it to, to really make a change? It's hard, but uh, it's hard, but it's also extremely rewarding. And the fact that we're small is also one of our strengths. So w working with our supply chain partners who are really, in fact, our partners and we have great so uh, solidarity towards them. Um, the benefit of being a small brand is that we can go up to them and say, hey, we want to do this. Um, and they are very willing to try things out because it's interesting for them also as innovators and to be leaders in, in these manufacturing techniques to be able to um, develop more sustainable techniques. So what happens typically is that they try something out with us, it works, and they can really present that project or that solution, excuse me, to the bigger brands. Right. Um, so it's really interesting for them as well. Uh, uh, you're a little bit of a guinea pig there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, it's exactly. Good, it's good to, to you, you're, you know you're at the forefront then. Huh? So, so um, I, I, I want to talk to you about what I call the, the climate change conundrum, and, and, and especially in the fashion world, because um, you already mentioned uh, in the Netherlands, we only wear a piece of clothes on average seven times, and then we discard it. Um, and if you want to uh, take care that people enjoy their clothes longer, mm -hmm. it will hurt the business model. And the business model in the fashion industry is fast fashion. So get people to buy lots of clothes that don't need, throw it away again and buy new clothes again. So you, you, you one, want to change that, but two, you are in that business model. So how does that work for you? Yeah, that's a big challenge. You are trying to um, revolutionize the fashion industry, but you're very much part of the fashion mm -hmm. industry. For us, it's um, really about the message that we send. So A, by making the product that we, the way that we make the product, but also our approach to sharing all of the information that we have gained. So we're really not about, you know, doing all of this innovation and keeping it for ourselves. In fact, we do a lot of these type of speaking events, both with customers, but also other members of industry to mm -hmm. share, hey, we've done this, you can do it too, type of um, approach. Um, but and you, then- you so, but, so that is on the production side. That's not on trying to sell as much clothes as possible side. Yeah, no, and, and also with our customers. In fact, w when you go and shop on, on our website, you can select a style and you can see all of the environmental impact of that product, exactly how much it will cost you, cost you in terms of water, CO2, land and biodiversity. Um, and we are very big promoters of slow fashion. So love your clothes, take care of your clothes. And it is a contradiction in many ways, I suppose, you know, um, but you've also seen it with brands like Patagonia. They had a really famous advertisement of don't buy this jacket. Mm -hmm. So you definitely see that, you know, certain brands are really yeah. um, starting to reshift Way that they're um, selling their products. So, and I, but you, you know what the effect was of that ad campaign, huh? Yes, I know. More people bought it. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I, I understand that. But that is a really big challenge. I think also um, now Black Friday is coming. Mm -hmm. How do you tell people don't go out there and buy all that crap? You don't need it. And that's the big um, challenge between the environmental crisis and this um, capitalist over-consuming um, environment that we are all part of because there's many debates about circularity being a key tool to fighting climate change, which mm -hmm. is true, 
But there's another sort of big elephant in the room, which is this overconsumption. Um, I don't have the answer as to how we can change all of that, but it's all about changing that culture when it comes to fashion, that culture of fashion, of really valuing your clothes. And just as the fashion industry used large levels of marketing to convince us all that we need all of these last minute pieces to look like our favorite celebrities, I think we have a responsibility to use those equal means of marketing to reshape the culture of fashion into one that is more sustainable and loving of our environment. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and that's very much what we are also trying to do. Uh, a lot of work to be done there. Um, so you, you, Mud Jeans have been there for uh, 10 years. Uh, you're still growing. So, so could, could you tell me a little bit about the pace and the traction you have right now? Yeah, so you know we are growing, growing um, steadily, but also pushing hard. So last year we hit the two mil. This year we want to double that. We have um, some great investors uh, also supporting us. So we really are right now in the traction of growing. Um, and though that might be a paradox for exactly the topic that you were just uh, hitting with a question before, but for us it is important to grow a little bit in order to have. A bigger influence in the mm. industry so and why are people choosing your brand is is that because they like the jeans or is it more about the sustainable story well looking at the type of customers that we have i mean we definitely the the type of uh, jeans that we have are the classic style jeans. We have a few unique styles every now and then but what's unique of mud jeans is we have a cross seasonal collection um but what the feedback that we get from our customers is that yes, they love the way that we make jeans and mm -hmm. the fact that, um, yeah, you can feel good of that product that you're wearing. You know that no one was harmed in the making of that product, right. that we're doing the best that we can to lower our impact on the environment and that we take responsibility over our own waste. There are very, very, very few, if none, slowly, there's a few that are taking that responsibility over their own waste. Yeah. So, so because th that will be my follow up question. Isn't it hard to compete against big brands that are more and more, um, well, uh, 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 let's say on the surface, uh, uh, aware of the environmental ch challenges? So if you go to a random big jeans brand, they have a sustainability page on the website and they have like, we're, we're trying to get there, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you're uh, uh, a, a small brand. So, so is it hard to compete against um, the big brands becoming or trying to become a little bit more greener? Yeah, absolutely. It's all about budget. So if they have a huge uh, marketing budget to talk about how um, green they are, that's also something to compete against. But to be really honest, um, one of our biggest concerns is not so much the competition, but the claims. Uh, right now, there is a really big problem with greenwashing where brands have certain statements and then they don't back up those statements with the data. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, again, our main objective is just to be pioneers, to continue to push those boundaries. And we make statements, but we always back them up with data. Data is our holy grail. <laughs> So um, you've been with the company for two years now. Yes. What, what are your biggest lessons in, in working in this circular business model? Well, um, yeah, really, again, leaning on the comment I just made, those two things, there's a lot of people out there claiming lots of things, but the ones really making a difference is are very few. And again, the power of data. Um, here at this job, I really... Uh, dove deep in the water with developing our LCA over the last two years, and it was um, yeah, a LCA fun is challenge. The, is, is the lifetime life cycle life, analysis? Yes, life cycle analysis report, which basically is all about measuring your impact. Yeah. Um, for us, is as cradle to gate, which means basically from the cotton bulb up to the finished product. So, so what you so th that data part, so, so life cycle analysis. What I find in some entrepreneurs, they are uh, very much focusing on if they want to become more sustainable on the coffee cups. And they mm -hmm. say, well, we're recycling the coffee cups. and But they're missing out a big chunk of, of where they can really uh, save on, on, on CO2 emissions mm -hmm. because they work with their gut feeling. How did that 
uh, life cycle analysis help you in, in really making an impact? Um, you know, it is far more powerful to make decisions based on data analysis than it is to do it on a gut um, basis. It's, and that's definitely what we've done. When you know your impact and you break it down in a life cycle analysis, you know at which stage you have certain red flags and you can develop strategies exactly to tackle those red flags. So for example, we know that our forte is the recycled content. That's also what's bringing down our impact. We also know that some suppliers are already using renewable energy. That's also bringing down our impact, mm -hmm. but some of them are not. So what are we? what is our biggest strategy goal? One is to increase the use of recycled content, hence our project for 100% post-consumer recycled cotton. And the second is to work with our with that one supplier to reach that renewable energy objective so it's it just completely reshapes your strategy mm -hmm. into a far more successful one so if you would uh, advise uh, entrepreneurs that are watching this uh, what would your advice be you know follow the numbers we do it in business why not do it environmentally i think there's huge benefits to using a life cycle analysis um, and there's also business benefits behind it. If you are able to become far more efficient in the way that you are producing, um, the way that you're using your resources, your materials, then you're also making a, a business case for, for that analysis um, because you're saving money on, on those aspects. But also, for example, from a fashion um, industry perspective, we are so dependent on natural resources, it's in our interest to learn to work with them better and uh, protect the environment. Laura, thank you very much. And uh, uh, looking forward to seeing you at the 9th of December, 2021. Thanks for having me and until then.